So what sort of observations can we make that might suggest someone is at risk from acute injury or is developing acute kidney injury? Or if they already have an acute kidney injury, how the condition is progressing? What observations are there and what are their meanings? Well, first of all, let's remember that clinically, AKI is characterized by a rapid reduction in kidney function. There's reduced renal function. When I was young, we used to call it acute renal failure. So the kidney is responsible for maintaining many of the homeostatic parameters within the body. And if the kidney is not functioning normally, it can't function in this normal physiological way. So it will fail to maintain fluid balance and fluid will be retained in the body. There'll be a positive fluid balance. And the kidneys also regulate uh, the level of electrolytes such as sodium, potassium, magnesium, calcium, chloride. So if the kidney is not able to perform its physiological functions, then it can't maintain electrolyte balance and there's going to be an electrolyte derangement. And typically electrolytes like sodium and potassium are going to be excessively retained. And the kidney is also responsible for regulating acid base homeostasis. So if the kidney is not working, this is not going to be regulated anymore. And the person will tend to develop a metabolic acidosis. So this is the term we should be using. This is the new international term, acute kidney injury. It's replaced the term acute renal failure. And it's good because this allows earlier detection and management of acute kidney injury. To consider the disease as, as a spectrum of severity. From less severe forms of acute kidney injury to more advanced injury when acute uh, kidney failure may require renal replacement therapy. So let's get down and look at some of these features in the next slide. Now perhaps the most fundamental observation we can make is the urine output, particularly the volume of urine which is being produced. Now normally we would say that someone should produce 0.5 mils of urine per kilogram of body weight per hour. But that's kind of based on their ideal body weight. So if someone weighs 90 kilograms, but they should only weigh 60 kilograms, then we should really calculate their urine output based on their ideal body weight rather than their actual body weight because the fat isn't very metabolically active. So we're looking for 0.5 mils of urine per kilogram of patient body weight per hour. So if someone weighs 60 kilograms, we would expect them to produce at least 30 mils of urine per hour. Now with children, we'd like them to produce more. With children, we're looking at more one mil per kilogram of body weight per hour. And with uh, very young children, with babies, we want them to produce two mils of urine per kilogram per hour. So we need to observe this. Now how we observe this is just a matter of for us to use our initiative, but we need the patient to urinate in something and we then need to measure it because we should do this quite precisely. Assessing accurate fluid balance and the urine that someone's actually producing it is a fundamental necessity. Now, another fundamental consideration if someone's not passing urine is for us to decide whether it is that the kidney is not producing the urine, therefore it's not being passed, or whether the kidney is producing the urine, but it's being retained in the bladder. Because you'll know yourself there's times when you haven't passed urine for several hours, but it's not because you've gone into acute kidney injury. It's because you haven't emptied your bladder. And of course, there's pathological conditions which make voiding of urine difficult or indeed virtually impossible. So we need to differentiate. Is there reduced production of urine or is there retention of urine? Now, if there's retention of urine, the bladder will fill up and store the urine that the kidneys are producing. So I wonder if the bladder is full is a fundamental clinical question. So we can percuss the pelvis, we can palpate the pelvis, we can use ultrasound volumetric scans, we can use our clinical skills to decide if the bladder is filling up, in which case the patient is probably not in acute renal failure because they're producing urine that's filling up the bladder. 
as a last resort, if we can't decide whether there's urine in the bladder, then we may need to catheterize these patients. But we always retain catheterization as a last resort. It's an uncomfortable procedure, but the key thing is if someone is developing acute kidney injury, it greatly increases the risk of infection, which we want to avoid if at all possible. Now, acute kidney injury is a sudden reduction in renal function or in kidney function. But it's vital to know, this is the key thing here, that this is reversible. All we need to do is keep the patient well enough to give them the time to spontaneously recover. We're dealing with a reversible condition. But the deterioration typically develops over 48 hours. Now, it can be more quickly than that. It can be slower than that. But typically... The reduction in renal function takes place over about 48 hours and nearly always there's reduced urine volumes or the majority of cases there's going to be urine volumes. Now you can get acute kidney injury where the volumes of urine are still produced but that urine is not concentrated. But the concern we mostly have is with reduced urine volumes because when there's reduced urine volumes that's more serious. That's a more serious clinical syndrome. Now, urea is a waste product that contains nitrogen. Now, what happens is the cells of the body are metabolizing proteins and producing waste nitrogen. That goes into the blood and forms ammonia, but ammonia is very alkaline and very toxic. So the first time the ammonia goes through the liver, the liver will convert it into urea. Still nitrogen containing, but it's soluble and very non-toxic for the amount of nitrogen it contains. And because it's highly soluble, the kidneys can excrete it in the physiological situation. But of course, if we've got renal failure, the kidneys are no longer able to excrete the urea. Therefore, the amount of urea in the blood builds up. And this is called uremia, an increase in the amount of urea in the blood. Now, a group of experts called the Acute Kidney Injury Network like a more precise definition of acute kidney injury. And they say that an acute kidney injury is present when any one of these is present. So you only need one of these to present in your patient to diagnose acute kidney injury. The first criteria, an absolute increase in serum creatinine. So if the serum creatinine goes above 26.4 micromoles per litre or 0.3 milligrams per deciliter, that is the definition of an acute kidney injury. There's a rise in the amount of creatinine. And we've done a separate video in this series that goes into creatinine in quite a lot more detail if you want more information on that. Now, another possibility is that you can get an acute on chronic renal failure. So if someone can have a degree of chronic kidney disease, CKD, but then get a superimposed AKI, acute kidney injury, on top of that. And this will result in a percentage increase in serum creatinine of 50% or greater. So in other words, 1.5 fold from the pe person's baseline. So if someone's got previous chronic kidney disease or a degree of chronic kidney disease, it's good if we know their baseline creatinine and then if it's going up 50% in this short period of time, if it goes up 50% acutely, then that's also classified as an acute kidney injury. And the third criteria is a reduction in urine output defined as less than 0.5 mils per kilogram per hour for more than a six hour period. So we should be observing the patient's urine volumes, ideally if we can, every hour and if they're producing less than this obligatory 0.5 mils per kilogram per hour and remember the kilograms is an ideal body weight if they're producing less than this for six hours that is also an acute kidney injury so any one of those is a diagnostic criteria so this is a patient we catheterized and didn't find as much urine in the bladder as we would have liked, as you can clearly see. And we have terms that describe this. So an oliguria is less than 400 mils of urine per day. So for an adult, that's well below the 0.5 mils per kilogram per hour. 
So oliguria, less than 400 mils of urine being produced per day. Olig means few. Urea, of course, is the suffix meaning in the urine. Now, anurea technically means without urine. An, as the prefix, means without. So anurea, it can mean no urine being produced at all, but we would classify a patient as having anurea if they're producing less than 100 mils of urine per day. And both of these are clearly very serious conditions and anurea is particularly serious. If the patient is anuric, we are very concerned. Now, the most common cause of pre-renal failure is reduced perfusion of the kidney with blood. And that's probably most times going to be caused by a reduced volume of blood or some other form of shock. So the patient may well be hypovolemia and it's the hypovolemia which is causing the reduced renal perfusion. But at the same time, the hypovolemia can cause other clinical features that we can recognise. So it's not that the acute kidney injury is causing the hypovolemia, it's the hypovolemia that's causing the acute kidney injury. And there may be other concurrent clinical features for us to look out for. So for example, increased capillary refill time. It takes longer for the capillaries to refill, indicating the patient may be hypotensive. Or there could be peripheral vasoconstriction with cold skin, pale skin, pallor. Cold peripheries, cold hands and feet. And when someone's hypovolemic, there's an attempted compensatory tachycardia. And we can detect this as a fast, weak, thready pulse. So the pulse feels fast, but it just feels like a little thread beneath our fingers. It's not the full pulse we would like. There can also be postural hypotension. So if someone feels dizzy when they sit up, or especially if they stand up, then that's an indication that they could well be hypovolemic because they have postural hypotension. And hypovolemic patients are often thirsty as well. So if we see these features, consider that the patient could be hypovolemic and the hypovolemia is going to put the person at increased risk of developing a pre-renal acute kidney injury. Now, if there's reduction in kidney function in acute kidney injury, the kidney is not going to be able to excrete the urea. So there'll be a rise in the amount of urea in the blood. Now, really, this should be called hyperureaemia, but, it, but it's not. Um, there's an increase in bun, blood urea nitrogen, and that is described as an azotemia, an increase in the amount of the nitrogen-containing products in the blood. And there's also an increase in the amount of urea compared to creatinine. So yes, we know that the creatinine levels can rise in acute kidney injury. But what this is saying is that the urea levels rise disproportionately. So normally in the blood would expect 10 times more urea than creatinine. That would be the normal situation, 10 times more urea than creatinine. But while in acute kidney injury, the amount of creatinine will go up, the amount of urea will go up even more disproportionately. So we can end up with 20 times more urea than creatinine in the blood. There's an increased urea to creatinine ratio. Now, of course, if we don't drink for a period of time, the amount of fluid in the blood will start to drop. And that's going to be detected by the hypothalamus which is going to stimulate the production of the antidiuretic hormone. And the antidiuretic hormone will increase the reabsorption of water from the renal tubules because it's antidiuretic. It's going to reduce urine volumes. So this is a perfectly normal adaptive response. So if you were walking in the desert between water holes, you wouldn't want to be producing huge amounts of urine because you would become dehydrated and die. So when blood volumes drop, it's the most natural thing in the world for your kidneys to want to retain as much water as possible. And that's what they do. When the kidneys are hypoperfused, the kidneys assume that we're hypovolemic because we're dehydrated. So they start retaining water. 
This is an adaptive response, it's a good thing. It's only when it gets down to this particular point that it develops into acute renal failure. So if someone was walking through the desert for a few days and stopped producing urine, we'd have to consider that to be normal and adaptive response. And the other thing is that in pre-renal acute renal failure or pre-renal acute kidney injury, the amount of sodium in the urine is low. It's less than 20 millimoles per litre. And again, this is an adaptive response to try and improve our survival because we want to retain as much sodium as we can in the blood in this sort of dangerous dehydration situation because the sodium is very osmotic and the sodium will attract more water into the blood. So the last thing we want to do is get rid of the sodium in the urine. We want to keep it in the blood because the sodium will attract more water and that will maintain blood volume, that will maintain intravascular volume. And that's what's going to perfuse our brains, that's what's going to perfuse our muscles so we can make it to the next water hole and get a drink. So in a sense, these uh, features of pre-renal AKI can be considered to be adaptive to improve our survival chances. Now in intrarenal acute kidney injury, as in all forms of acute kidney injury, there's going to be reduced volumes. But remember in intrarenal acute kidney injury, it can be caused by glomerular problems, this ball of capillaries within the Bowman's capsule. And these are what we call nephritic features. So nephritic features are developed by glomerular pathology. And there can be hypertension, because remember it's the kidney that's controlling the blood pressure to a large extent. And there can be hematuria because the glomeruli become leaky and the blood leaks out from the glomerular capillaries into Bowman's space, on into the nephrons, on into the collecting ducts. And the blood enters the urine. And it's the same with the protein urea because the glomeruli become leaky. Large molecules like proteins, which would normally be retained within the blood, are able simply to leak out into the glomerular filtrate. And because they're not a physiological molecule, because there's not supposed to be protein in the glomerular filtrate, the tubules don't have a way to reabsorb the protein and it's simply left in the urine. And another nephritic feature is edema. We may be able to detect systemic edema in our patients. So when we see these things, consider that they are, may be nephritic features and that there may be a glomerular origin to the pathology. And another feature with glomerular origin is that the red blood cells will get through into the tubules. And there the red blood cells do tend to clump together. But they clump together inside the tubule, so the clot, if you like, the mini clot, the agglutinated red blood cells clumping together, take up the shape of the tubule. So when they're passed through, they retain the shape of the tubule, and we call these casts. So red blood cell casts in the urine with a proteinuria indicates glomerular nephritis as a likely diagnosis. Now, if there's a breakdown of muscle, if there's a rhabdomyolysis, then myoglobin can be released into the blood, causing a myoglobinemia. And that can filter through the gemelli into the tubules, causing a myoglobin urea. And the situation is much the same if there's a hemolysis, if there's a breakup of the red cells. There can be a hemoglobinemia, and again, that will be filtered through into the tubules. And both of these molecules, because they're sticky, have the potential to block up the renal tubules, block up the nephrons, causing intrarenal AKI. And remember, both of these molecules are very pigmented. The reason that blood is red is because of the haemoglobin. The reason that myoglobin, or the reason that steak or muscle is, is red is because of the myoglobin it contains. And as they go through the renal tubules, they'll be, they'll go a bit rusty. They will be oxidized and they'll take up this tea color. Or sometimes they can even look brown or black. So they can cause this extreme staining of the urine if there's a myoglobinuria or a haemoglobinuria. But remember, both of these molecules have the potential to cause intrarenal acute kidney injury. 
Now we know that pre-renal hypoperfusion can lead to acute tubular necrosis with death of the cells lining the nephrons. And these will slough off the basement membrane and they will collect clogging up the nephrons resulting in intrarenal AKI. And as they work out, again, there's going to be casts because they're going to retain the shape of the tubule in which they formed. And these are often called dirty brown granular casts. And they're made up of these epithelial cells, which is a feature of acute tubular necrosis. And another interesting feature in intrarenal acute kidney injury is that a lot of sodium can be lost. So remember we mentioned that with pre-renal acute kidney injury, the amount of sodium in the urine was low because it's an adaptive response. Whereas intrarenal AKI is not an adaptive response, it's a pathological process. And this means that the kidneys are going to excrete more sodium in the urine. So the sodium in the urine is increased, typically greater than 40 millimoles per litre. Now in post-renal acute kidney injury, there's going to be the features of acute kidney injury, as we would expect, caused by the acute reduction in kidney function, but we can also notice some additional features that can be characteristic of the post-renal etiology. So for example, there might be distension of the bladder because the flow of urine is blocked. The, the, the full bladder when catheterized is another feature, that there was a blockage of the normal flow of urine. And this is particularly likely to occur in men with significant prostatic enlargement that could be caused by benign prostatic hyperplasia, or indeed it could be caused by a malignant cancer of the prostate. Now, one of the advantages of using the AKI, the acute kidney injury classification, is that we can describe the degree of severity of the condition. So it's not kind of a on off. Yes, the patient has renal failure. No, the patient doesn't have renal failure. And it means we can use this rifle classification as advocated by the acute dialysis quality initiative. Now, this is an international group of clinicians, intensivists, renal physicians. And, and they decided this is the most appropriate way to go. So the rifle classification. So RIFLE, R-I-F-L-E, that's the new monarch. Now it starts off with, off with risk of renal dysfunction. So these are people at risk. Then the next one is where there is actually injury to the kidney. And then the next one, F, is where that injury is sufficient to cause reduced renal function and to give acute kidney injury. So risk first, injury second, failure of the kidney third. And the fourth one is loss of renal function for a period of four weeks. And the final one is end stage kidney disease, which is irreversible. So the RIF talk about level of dysfunction and the LE talk about possible classifications of outcomes of the AKI. Now we need to know about the complications of acute kidney injury so we can observe for these complications potentially developing or prevent them wherever we can. So fluid overload is one possibility because the kidneys are not able to excrete the excess fluid from the body, the water accumulates. And this can cause systemic edema or it can cause pulmonary edema. So if there's too much fluid in the circulatory system, then the heart may not be able to cope with all the venous return it's receiving, especially if the person already has some cardiac compromise. And this can lead to heart failure, congestive cardiac failure. And if there's pulmonary edema, we can recognize that with orthopnea. Orthopnea is difficulty in breathing when lying down, relieved when the patient sits up. And that's very characteristic of left ventricular failure, leading to pulmonary edema, this orthopnea.
Now another complication is hyperkalemia. This is high levels of potassium in the blood. The levels of potassium can rise and the real risk with this is that if the levels of potassium rise quickly that can lead to ventricular fibrillation. So we should monitor these patients if we're worried about them because there is a possibility of ventricular fibrillation if they're hyperkalemic. Now patients with acute kidney injury will start feeling unwell because they're retaining so many toxins in the blood. So there can be nausea, vomiting, anorexia is a very common feature. People with acute kidney injury do not want to eat. And there can also be gastrointestinal bleeding. Now these features here, the nausea, vomiting, anorexia and GI bleed are largely related to the uremia which we'll consider on the next slide. Infections are going to be more likely, particularly of the lung and of the urinary tract. So we need a high index of suspicion for the development of infection. And if these patients become septic, that's going to greatly worsen the prognosis. And there's other conditions which are, are more probable to be concurrent with acute kidney injury. They're not actual complications of the acute kidney injury, they're not actually caused by it, but they do often occur together. So we need to keep an eye open for pancreatitis, jaundice and hepatitis. Now of course there are certain amounts of urea in the blood all the time, but uremia means an increase in the amount of urea. And as we see from the diagram on the right, from the structural formula illustrated there, the urea molecule contains a lot of nitrogen. There's an H2N and there's an NH2 group. And that's the, the reason that the liver synthesizes urea. It's to package the waste nitrogen in this highly soluble, relatively non-toxic molecule prior to excretion via the kidneys. But of course, if the kidneys aren't working properly, if there's an acute kidney injury, the urea will accumulate in the blood. And this causes anorexia, nausea and vomiting. These are features of uremia. And pruritus is itchiness. The skin becomes itchy. And there can also be what is called a urea frost. So if there's a lot of urea in the blood, that will enter the sweat and go onto the surface of the body. The water component of the sweat will dry and that will leave the white powdery urea on the surface of the body. And sometimes when you run your fingers over the surface of the patient's skin, you get this white powder on your hands. And that's called urea frost because the urea will dry and crystallize out on the surface of the skin. Now it's been known for 200 years that there's an association between renal dysfunction and hemorrhagic tendencies, the likelihood that someone is going to bleed. And this can include epistaxis, no, nosebleeds, gastrointestinal bleeds, even intracerebral bleeds or subdural bleeds. So there's hemorrhagic tendencies. Now the reason for this is related to impaired platelet function, the thrombocytes. So the uremia inhibits the normal activity of the platelets. And it also seems to adversely affect the normal relationship between the platelets and the vascular endothelium that can initiate coagulation. So uremic toxins and anemia also probably play a role in this as well. But there's definitely this association between the uremia and the hemorrhagic episodes. They're quite common, so we have to keep a, a close eye out for them. Now, the uremia will adversely affect the functioning of the central nervous system. So there can be neurological sequelae. Lethargy, the patients feel very tired. Somnolence, they're, they're very sleepy. 
there can be reversal of the sleep-wake cycle with patients being awake overnight and sleeping through the day. And there's cognitive and memory deficits. And eventually the level of consciousness will start to reduce and the patient can go into uremic coma. Now what about the course of acute kidney injury? There's going to be a natural evolution because remember we said that our aim is to keep the patient alive and well until spontaneous recovery will come about. And this usually takes between 7 and 21 days. So in most cases of acute kidney injury, the kidneys will spontaneously recover in between one week and three weeks, as long as we can keep them healthy during that time. If the sepsis, if there's continuing infection, that will adversely affect the evolution of the condition and prolong it. And then as the condition starts to resolve, there's often a diuretic phase. Now a diuresis is an increase in the volume of urine produced. So there can be an increase in the volume of urine produced. So the patient can go from being oliguric to being polyuric really quite quickly. And this diuretic phase can last for a few days. So what happens in this diuretic phase is the mellular function can return, but tubular reabsorption is still going to be inhibited. So the patient can start producing large volumes of urine. And it's very important that we carry on monitoring this because even though there's large volumes of urine, it can be very dilute. And we'll call a polyurea or a diuresis greater than three liters of urine being produced per, per day. So we have this situation where glomerular filtration starts working again, but reabsorption is not yet physiologically effective. And as well as water, this can mean that the patient can rapidly excrete a lot of electrolytes like sodium and potassium. Now, we mentioned that hyperkalemia can cause cardiac arrest. That's true, especially if it goes up quickly. But it's also true that if the potassium has been up for a period of time, then the myocardium will adapt to that. And if the potassium rates drop quickly again, that can also cause cardiac arrest. So we have to be very careful during the diuretic phase to monitor fluid loss, but also to monitor the urea and electrolytes and correct those as it becomes necessary to do so. Because we don't want rapid changes in the level of the electrolytes. We want them to go back down to normal levels gradually and we don't want them to go below normal levels.